Fourth down, Stafford throws. Touchdown to Calvin Johnson. trying to end it here. Fourth down. Dalton steps up. Dalton throws. It's complete. Caught by Boyd. Tyler Boyd. Touchdown. Remarkable. Fellas, do you know what every single one of those plays have in common? Did you catch it? Every single one of those was a fourth down play that won the game. Every single one of them. You know, fourth down is the most intense down in football. Is it not? Right? A team has 10 yards to go, and after three plays, you haven't made it. You're left with the most important decision that you could possibly have, what to do on fourth down, right? You know how it is. You, you play quarterback from the couch, do you not? You play coach from the couch, right? Uh, are we going to just give in? Are we going to punt? Right? Are we close enough to try a field goal? How, how confident are we in our kicker's leg today? Or, or are we going to roll the dice and go for it? right? Fourth down. It's the most intense down in all of football. Think about it. Coaches have become legends because of fourth down calls that they've made, like some of those right there. Players have had their whole careers changed, their whole lives changed because of a play that they made on fourth down. Or teams have had their whole seasons flipped because of a play that was made on fourth down. Fourth down is the most intense down in, only, in all of football. But you know what? There's only one down, one play that's more intense in all of football than fourth down. You know what it is? Fourth and goal. Fourth and goal. Because fourth and goal could change everything. Fourth and goal is a make or break down because either you convert and you score and you look like the hero or you fail and you give the other team the ball and perhaps the whole game changes on one play. Fourth and goal. Here's what we're going to talk about tonight. What does it look like to live as a fourth and goal kind of man? What does it look like to live with that intensity, that urgency, that passion as a fourth and goal kind of man? We're going to dive into God's Word for a little bit tonight. We're going to be in multiple passages of Scripture. So what I'm going to just encourage you to do is lock in, lean in. We're going to put some verses on the screen behind me for you guys to track along with where we're going to be. And if you got your phone or any kind of little thing to take notes on, man, I'd love for you to take notes because here's what I believe. When we write it down, for some reason it sticks in here and it sticks in here a little bit more and then we might actually live it out. And so tonight we're going to talk about what does it look like to be a fourth and goal kind of man, to live with that kind of intensity as God calls us to. Here's the question, what does it even mean to be a man anyway? 
What does it mean? Our culture says a lot of different things makes you a man. Some people would say it means you like to hunt and fish. Any boys like to hunt and fish in here? Okay. Our culture would say, well, hey, a real man hunts for their groceries, drives a pickup truck, can work with tools. You watch football, you like chicken wings and eat steak, and your favorite color is camo. That's what our culture would say. Well, that defines a man. But I'm here to tell you the reality is that's not what makes you a man. And the truth is none of those things can be true of you, and you can still be a man. But that's what our culture wonders. I think one of the areas, one of the places where we go wrong is there's no real rite of passage anymore from boyhood to manhood. Think about it. Tribes that you read about all throughout history, there was some rite of passage from boyhood to manhood. But in our American culture, we've gotten it so confused. There's not a rite of passage anymore from boyhood to manhood. So how do we even know when someone is a man? Right? Obamacare says it's 26. Budweiser says it's 21. The U.S. Army says it's 18. DMV goes 16. Disney says 10 because they start charging you adult prices at that point. And the only place that we can find unity is between Delta and Advil because they say at 2, you're an adult. What does it mean? Seriously, what does it mean to be a man? And so because there is no rite of passage, because there is no clear definition from boyhood to manhood, here's what we get. We get this thing called delayed boyhood. There's a new segment of the male population in between boy and man called a dude. You know what a dude is? A dude's really just a boy that shaves. And what happens is that because it takes a man to initiate a boy into manhood, but because we don't know what men are anymore, we now have men that are doing boyish things, trying to initiate themselves into manhood. Think about it. You know somebody who does that. Because dudes, here's what dudes say. Well, I got the sweetest rims, or I got the biggest truck, or I killed the biggest deer, or I can consume more than you. More women, more money. More stuff, more drugs, more whatever. The list goes on and on. And the problem becomes dudes will chase, at, chase after success and accomplishment rather than take responsibility. And a man, we'll see tonight, takes responsibility. Now, there are two responses from the world to the problem of manhood. Answering this question, what is a man? There are two responses of the world to the problem of manhood. First, the world says, well, we're just all the same. All of us, we're just all the same. There's no real difference, and so you can really use whatever restroom you want to use because we're all the same. That's the first response. The second response of the world is this. Well, men are just better. Men are just better. And the reality is that's chauvinism. And both of those are wrong, and I don't believe God's pleased with either one of them. So the reality also that we see today is that most churches are not very filled with men. Are we true? Most churches are filled with women, but there's not very many dudes who accompany those women. And here's why I believe the reality is, and I can say this as a pastor, because for so long as a church, we've sold it that if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a Christ follower as a man, you got to do all these woman-like things. You got to sing in the choir, hold hands, share your feelings, boohoo a lot, go through a lot of Kleenexes, and that's what makes you a man. And here's what happens. A lot of dudes have said, hey, if that's what makes you a Christian, I don't want to be one of those. And fellas, I'm here to tell you tonight that you, the, the call to be a Christ follower does not mean that you have to leave your man card at the door. The call to be a Christ follower as a man is one of the highest callings that God could give. And God has a perfect design for you to live as a man. And so tonight what I want us to see is I want us to see four different characteristics from Scripture that define what I'm going to call a fourth and goal man. A man who lives with the intensity, the purpose, and the passion as a fourth and goal kind of man. And I believe that God's desire is for every single one of us, no matter who you are tonight, no matter whether you're a son, a dad, a grandfather, a husband, I believe God wants us all to live as a fourth and goal kind of man. Now some of you, I believe you showed up for this weekend and quite honestly, you're living for you. If we just laid it out tonight, you spend the majority of your time, your attention, your energy, your resources on you. And man, my prayer for you is that you would walk into this weekend and that you would realize that God has something so much better for you than just living for you. That you would realize that there is joy in exchanging an old life of self and sin to find a new life of joy and hope and purpose is only found in a relationship with Jesus. And I believe that's where some of you are this weekend. 
Some of you, you walk into this weekend, I think there are many men who might say you walk into this weekend and man, you've trusted Jesus to exchange old life for new life in Christ as we say around here. But the reality is you're not living in your purpose. As a husband, as a dad, as a son, as a grandfather, and as a man. And here's my prayer for you this weekend. That God would awaken you, that he would remind you, that he would challenge you, that when you trust Jesus, he calls for a full life surrender. And in that surrender is a joy, is a hope, and is a purpose that nothing else of this world can give you. It just can't. And so tonight, I want us to see what it looks like to live as a fourth and goal kind of man. Here's our first truth tonight, boys. A fourth and goal man lives with urgency. Write that down. A fourth and goal kind of man lives with urgency. Think about it. There's no greater urgency for a football team than fourth and goal, right? It changes everything. Like the whole season could turn upside down on a fourth and goal play. It's a make or break moment. And some of you are going to hate me for bringing this up. But November 7, 2015 gave us one of the most unforgettable fourth down plays ever for some Arkansas Razorbacks and for some Ole Miss Rebels. Arkansas was facing a fourth and 25. Maybe that rings a bell for some blue and navy in the room. Fourth and 25 in overtime. Arkansas trailed by seven. Fourth and 25, let me remind you, it was the first overtime. They trailed by seven. And here is what happened on fourth and 25. You guys take a look at this. Allen gets the snap. Got all kinds of time. He's going to fire to the sideline, complete to Henry, but Hunter well shy of the first down. He's going to lateral it back. Ball's on the ground. Picked up by Collins. Alex has got room at the 30, 25, 20. Collins at the 15, cuts back at the 10. This game's still alive, and the Hawks have a first down. Hunter Henry lateraled it back over his head, Keith, and we're still playing football. Fourth and 25. Just somebody hit him. Somebody hit him. Sorry to open up that wound for some boys in the room. Fourth and 25, and they converted. And some of you know, you know how the next, the next sequence went. A couple of plays later, Arkansas sticks it in the end zone, ties it at 52. It goes to double overtime. Arkansas wins the game, and ultimately it changes the whole course of Ole Miss' season, all because of a fourth down that was converted. You see, fourth down. <laughs> fourth down is the most intense play in all of football. Hey, listen to me. As you saw on that video, as you saw on that video, every player from Arkansas on the field, were they not playing with the most urgency of the whole game? They were whipped. They were tired. It was overtime. But man, they were living with urgency because fourth down mattered. Fourth down mattered. Listen to me, guys. A fourth and goal man lives with urgency. A fourth and gold man lives with urgency. Here's why. Because he understands that his role as a man matters greatly. A recent study showed that one in four children in the U.S., one in four, are growing up without a father in the home. And as a result, so many of the cultural breakdowns of our society can be traced right back to a dad not being present. Children who grow up without a father are four times more likely to end up in poverty. Girls without a father are seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager. Children without a father present are more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to face abuse and neglect, and more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Children without a father are two times more likely to suffer from obesity, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, and two times more likely to drop out of high school. Fellas, it's undeniable that the role of a man matters. It matters in our world, and the statistics show it to be true. You see, a fourth and gold man lives with urgency, understanding that his role as a husband, as a dad, as a son, as a grandson, as a man, it matters greatly. Living with urgency means this. It means that we take our role seriously, and we are serious about learning and growing. And you know what? I believe that's the reason that some of you are here at Man Up Weekend. Because you're wanting to take your role seriously. As a man, as a son, as a husband, as a dad, 
You want to take your role seriously. And you know what? I believe that if you take it serious and if you lean into the truth that God wants to pour into your life over the next 24 to 36 hours, I believe that it literally could. It could change the trajectory of your life as a man. Why? Because you choose to live with urgency and take it seriously. Living with urgency also means that our time is limited. Our time is limited. Jesus said this to his followers about the end of time. Look at these verses from Matthew 24, verse 36. This is what Jesus says. He says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Listen to what happens. He says, for in the days before the flood, we all know that story, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. They had no idea. Then it says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at it with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Verse 42, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Jesus says, live with urgency, fellas. Be alert, be ready because none of us know the day or the hour where Jesus will come back, but he's coming. And I can promise you one thing. We don't know the day or the hour, but we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. And we'll be one more day closer tomorrow if we get it. And so Jesus calls us to live with urgency because here's what he says there in Scripture, if you didn't catch it. He says it's so easy to get trapped by the ways and the motions of the world and to believe what matters most is how much we make or how far we work up on the ladder or how good our kid is at ball or how big a deer we kill or what house we live in. But Jesus says guard yourself. Guard yourself as leaders And don't get trapped by the ways of the world and forget to live with urgency because the time is short. Husbands, your time to love and value and speak truth into your wife, that time is limited. There's a time frame on your your time, fathers, to love and to lead and to guide those kids that are in your house. There's a time limit. There's a time frame on your ability to demonstrate Jesus to your coworkers and your buddies at the gym. The time is short. And so the call tonight is to live with urgency because our role as men, it matters. And a fourth and gold man is that kind of man. He lives with urgency. A fourth and gold man also does this. Fourth and gold man lives with dependency. He lives with dependency. Fourth and goal in a football game, think about it. It is, it is all about dependency. Is it not? First, The players are so dependent on their coach. Think about this for a moment. I was thinking about this as I was preparing. What would it be like if the players had to call the the play on fourth and goal? What would that be like? Like how chaotic would that TV timeout be for the players to try to say? Because you know what the quarterback wants to do. Quarterback wants to throw it because he wants to pad his stats a little bit more. And then the running back's over here going, but listen, dude, like I want my name in the headlines. So why don't you just hand it to me? I can know I can make it. And then you got all the wide receivers over here, all the prima donnas, they're just chirping, man. They're going like, throw it to me, throw it to me, I'm open. And tight end's going, I'm more open than any of you, and I could bench press all of you, okay? I'm open. And then you got the old lineman over here, right? And they're all down because they're feeling overlooked, like they don't matter. But we know the play don't happen if somebody doesn't block up front, right? Man, it would be chaos if it was left up to the players to make the call on fourth and goal. You know what that means? The players are dependent on their coach. You know what a fourth and gold man is? A fourth and gold man is dependent on his coach too. So if his coach is a little bit bigger than any coach on this earth, his coach is God the Father. And he knows the urgency of listening into him. See, Scripture tells us about the dangers of trying to play our own coach. Do you know that? Look at these verses from the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. It talks about trying to be your own coach. Verse 5, it says, This is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Listen to this. It says, that person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. Verse 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. 
God says the man who lives dependent only on himself, who calls his own plays, will ultimately fail. But the man who lives with dependency and confidence in God as his coach, when Scripture says that you will find purpose and prosperity in your life. Let me ask you a question, fellas. Who do you find yourself being dependent on more? You or the coach? Think about it. What about when life breaks? You're more dependent on you or the coach? What about this? What about when life's going really good? You had a good week, man. Work wasn't hard. You don't have to travel out of town. Money's pretty good. Who do you depend on more? You or the coach? What about for wisdom on how to love your wife? You depend on you or the coach? Raising kids, managing your money, how to carry out your job. Do you find yourself honestly depending more on you or more on the coach? Because you know how God made you? He made you to be dependent in a relationship with the coach. He created us to live in dependency. See, a fourth and gold man, they first lived dependent on God. But you know what? They also lived dependent on other brothers around them. Some of you need to catch that. A fourth and gold man lives dependent on other brothers around him. Think about it. In football, it is impossible for a single man, a single player, to convert a fourth down all by himself. It just can't happen. It cannot happen. I don't care if your name is Kyler Murray and you're going first in the draft, okay? All five foot, four, ten, eight of you, okay, whatever you are. I don't care if your name's Kyler Murray, Drew Brees, Dak Prescott, or my boy Tua. Okay, I don't care what your name is. Listen, you're not converting a fourth down by yourself. Why? Because you need every single one of those other brothers on the field, all 10 of them, to run with you, to challenge you, to block for you, to encourage you. See, a fourth and gold man lives with dependency on others. God designed us the same way. One of the wisest men in history, Solomon, wrote these verses in Scripture. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Look at this. He says to are better than one. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Fellas, God designed you and he designed me to live dependent on one another. That's why Man Up Weekend has become one of the most powerful weekends of our year. You know why? Because we get intentional about living in community and walking with other brothers and encouraging one another and challenging one another and pursuing Jesus together. And God begins to do something inside of us. And you know what happens? God goes, that's the way that I made you. That's the way that I made you. Men, you weren't designed to live life alone. And I'm not talking about do you live in the house with somebody else. I'm talking about do you have another man? Are there other men in your life who are up in your life? who are praying for you, challenging you, encouraging you, and holding you accountable to be a man of God. Man, I have one of the most incredible privileges. I counted it one of the most incredible privileges to work alongside some of the greatest men I know who are pastors here at The Exchange. Pastors Josh and Brian and Tyler and Matthew. Man, they aren't just co-workers that like we just do work together. They're my dudes. They're my bros. I need them. And you know what? They know things about me that a lot of people don't know. And I know that I can share with them when life's going really good and when it ain't. And they'll pray for me and they'll listen to me and they'll walk with me and they'll love me no matter what I share with them. Can I ask you something? Who you got in your world that's like that? Who in your world loves Jesus and loves you enough that they won't leave you alone? And if you don't have anybody, you know what? Chances are it's not because nobody will be that for you. But maybe it's because you've never been real enough to own that you need it and you've never asked somebody to be that for you. You see, what I found is that the strongest relationships in life, they are normally formed with those that we go to battle with. Think about it. Most of the strongest relationships in our life are formed with those that we go to battle with. Maybe for some of you, you're automatically like thinking about guys that you shared Friday night lights, man, playing ball back in high school. Man, we were in the locker room. We sweated together. We, we were bled together. For some of you, maybe you think about men that you literally stood next to in war as you defended our country. And it's relationships that will never be broken. Maybe you think about a friend who walked with you 
through some of the lowest moments of your life and when nobody else was there, they were. What I found is the strongest friendships are formed in the fire together. So let me ask you, who is an in the fire friend that you have? Who loves Jesus and loves you and won't leave you alone? What if this? What if God brought you here to Man Up Weekend to help you realize you need that and to help you find another man who could walk with you and become an in the fire kind of friend with you? See, listen to me. Living dependent on others doesn't make you weak. It makes you wise. Scripture tells us that. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person, so one man, I'm putting that in there, so one man sharpens, encourages, challenges, upholds another. God's word says it. A fourth and gold man lives with urgency and he lives with dependency for God and for others. There's a third trait, and it's this. Fourth and gold man understands his legacy. A fourth and gold man understands his legacy. How many of you, by show of hands, recognize the name Kevin Dyson? Anybody recognize the name Kevin Dyson? There are just droves of you all across the room. No, that's what I figured. Not really hardly anybody. You know what? You know when Kevin Dyson's name became famous? Some of you are going to recognize in a moment. 1999, Super Bowl 34, Tennessee Titans versus the then St. Louis Rams. Final drive of the Super Bowl. Rams are up by seven. Quarterback for the Tennessee Titans. Steve McNair. Alcorn University. Titans are trailing by seven. There's six seconds left. They have no timeouts. They just got to run the play. They have the ball on the Rams' 10-yard line, 10 yards away from tying up the Super Bowl and perhaps winning it. Steve McNair takes the snap. Kevin Dyson runs on a slant route across the middle. McNair hits him about the five-yard line, and about as soon as he catches it, linebacker Mike Jones embraces him and nails him, and right as he's tackling him, Kevin Dyson lunges out as far as he can with the ball, reaching as time expires, and the Super Bowl, the biggest game in the country, ends, and Kevin Dyson reaches, but he's still one yard short, and the final play of Super Bowl 34 looked just like this. You remember it? You know what happened? In that moment, Kevin Dyson and the 1999 Tennessee Titan team, they left a legacy. You know what leg legacy they left? They fell one yard short. They fell one yard short. See, here's the reality, guys. Every man, whether you realize it or not, leaves a legacy. Every man who crosses the goal leaves a legacy. Every man who falls short leaves a legacy. We're all leaving a legacy. So let me ask you this question tonight, fellas. What kind of legacy are you leaving? A fourth and gold man realizes the legacy he's leaving. So what kind of legacy are you leaving? See, for most of us, we typically don't think about legacy until we get older, right? But can I tell you something? Every moment of your life, dad, Every moment of your life, husband and son and high school student and grandfather, every moment of your life is writing the legacy that you leave. And catch this, legacies are not just defined by large public moments of life, but legacies are often left in the unseen moments of obedience of your life. We're all leaving a legacy. Every moment is creating a legacy. So let me ask you this. If your son grows up to treat and love his wife the way he sees you treat and love your wife, would you be proud of him? If your daughter grows up to marry a man just like you, because she probably will, would you be happy for her? If your coworkers define integrity by the way that you do your work, would your company be proud? So you're leaving a legacy. If your kids and grandkids spend their money the way they watch you spend your money, would you be proud for them? If your son grows up to use the language you use and live with the sexual purity standard that you've set, would you be pleased and would God be proud? You're leaving a legacy. If your wife and kids and friends understand the love of Jesus and the character of God and the only way they understand it is by what you model, would they be better off? 
It's weighty, fellas. But as leaders, as men, as fourth and gold men, we realize, we understand the legacy that we are leaving. And you're leaving one, whether you realize it or not. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the Old Testament, God gives a charge to his people on how to leave a legacy that will be worth following. Look at these verses. Grasp them with me. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, it says this. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Here's what God is saying to his people and to you and me, that a life that leaves a legacy worth following only starts, it only starts with a man who loves God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, and with all of his strength. He says, that's a legacy worth following. That's a legacy worth leaving as a man. And a man who leaves a legacy worth following allows the truth of God's word to guide every moment of his life. Fellas, we're all leaving a legacy. So for a moment, would you just think, what kind of legacy are you leaving? You see, a fourth down man, fourth down man realizes the legacy he's leaving. I wonder if you've ever been watching a football game before when a team finishes a play and they're so close to the first down that the referee can't even tell whether they made the mark. Ever seen that play before, right? And, and the referee, what does he do? He blows his whistle and he does like this. Why? Because he's stopping the clock. And then he calls for the chain gang. And the whole time we're sitting at home and we're like, no, dude, he's so short. I see the yellow line. Like, there's no way he's there. Okay, can I just tell you? Okay, that's a computerized yellow line. It's not always right on, all right? And so he, he calls the timeout and he calls the chain gang out, right? And then all like the 70-year-old dudes in the orange vest over on the sidelines, they run out with the chain gang, right? It looks just like this, like what we got here tonight. And they run out with the chains. And then what happens? You ever seen it before? You ever seen it? One guy, he puts his chain down and where the line of scrimmage, where they started, all right, the four downs, and he puts it down. And then the other guy stretches it all the way across the field and he puts his down over on this side, exactly 10 yards apart. And then what happens? They measure, right? And so if you've never seen it before, here's what happens. They begin to measure. They take the ball and they set it down and they see whether it fell short. And if it crosses the line, then they know that they made a first down. But if it comes short, then they realize they fall short. And what happens? The referee stands up after he measured. And what does he do? He looks at all the people on TV. And he looks at all the people at the game and he gives one of two signals. He either goes, first down. Or he says, they fell this short. This short. Listen to me, Phyllis. Every single one of us are leaving a legacy. And my fear is that far too many men are falling short. Far too many men today are like Kevin Dyson. And they're falling short of the goal can I give you a reminder tonight? A day is coming where Jesus, as judge, will call out the chain gang on our life. And we're going to stand before God as Father, but also as judge. And he's going to take a measurement. And he's going to measure where we are. And either we will have fallen short of his standard or we will have crossed the line by living for his purposes in our life. But God's going to measure greatest measurement in all of history for us. He's going to measure where are we. And can I tell you something tonight? Can I give you a reminder core shaking reality that in that moment when we stand before God as father but also as judge, listen to me, God in that moment is not going to measure what's the highest level of education that you received or the highest level of your company or your career path that you gain. 
in that moment, God will not measure with you ever get to a six-figure income. Did you ever get there? Because that means you're really providing. In that moment, God won't measure how big your truck was, how many guns you own, or the biggest buck that you shot. He just won't. In that moment, God will not measure the size of your biceps or the size of your bank account. In that moment, God will not measure the highest level of education or what resume, your resume looked like from all the great experiences that you had. Listen to me. He won't even measure in that moment how many times you made it to church or how many verses that you memorized. Now, you know what those things will leave you? Every one of those things will leave you short. Your very best that you could bring and the greatest measurement will leave you short. You know what he will measure? He's going to measure your faith. He's going to measure your faith. Scripture tells us this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not just highly unlikely, not doubtful, not maybe, I don't know, questionable. Scripture says, without faith, it is impossible to to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Listen to me, guys. The final and most important truth is this. A fourth and goal man is marked by faith. A fourth and goal man is marked by faith. Scripture says it is impossible, it is impossible to please God without faith. And then Hebrews defined it for us. What is faith? Faith is believing that God exists, and it is believing He is worth surrendering our whole lives to. That's faith. See, a man who's marked by faith is marked by a life of surrender. They go, God, you get all of me. My time, my gifts, my abilities, my relationships, my money. You're a better leader than I am. You know what a man of faith is? A man of faith is marked by humility. And they daily understand their need for God's grace in their life. To cover their mistakes and to make them acceptable before God. A man of faith is a man marked by forgiveness. Because he knows how much God has forgiven him. And he has to bring that same forgiveness to those around him. A man of faith is a man marked by love. He understands the depth, the riches, the height of God's love for him, and he reciprocates that love to everybody else in his life. A man of faith is a man characterized and marked by generosity. He understands what I have isn't really mine to start with, and it's not meant for me, but God has greater purposes for it. A man of faith is a man marked by being a servant. It's a man who serves at home, who serves in his church, and who serves in his community. He wakes up every day not looking for who's going to serve him, but he wakes up every day looking for opportunities to serve others. A man who is marked by faith is a man who is marked by relationship with the living God that transforms every part of his life. See, the truth is, fellas, you can bring your very best, try your hardest, do everything that you can on your own. And you'll still be just like Kevin Dyson. You'll still be short. But a man marked by faith is a man who can live confidently because a man marked by faith realizes he can't win the game by himself. But he is only, he is only victorious by faith in Jesus. Scripture tells us, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. Look at it, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Catch it, boys, but thanks be to God, because He gives us, not we win, He gives us, He imparts to us the victory. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news. See, a fourth and gold man lives with urgency, because he understands that his role matters, and your role matters. Fourth and gold man He'll live with dependency because he knows he needs to coach and he knows he needs other brothers. A fourth and gold man, fourth and gold man realizes the legacy he's leaving because it impacts everybody around him. But most importantly, a fourth and gold man is a man marked by faith. So let me ask you tonight, boys, 
Honestly, if you were honest, where are you living right now? Where are you living right now? Because here's what we face. The game's on the line. You can't do it alone. The measurement's coming. What call are you going to make?